Ok. Ah, oh, bonjour. Et quoi, je me vois, mon pin, je vais Before we start any event, we usually have a, a good way of opening things. So we did that with the smudge, and I want to begin with um, a prayer. At this time, I just ask you to take a moment of silence for yourself while I speak in my language. Ah, bonjour, je vais me dire. Je me vois, je te vois, mon pied, je te vois, 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 je te je Thank you. Thank you, Creator. I just ask Creator to come in and um, help us work with one another in a good way so we can hear things in a good way, that we could speak in a good way, and that we walk the road on a good way. And I ask this young gentleman to go around and give a smudge to everybody. With that, I say, Chimi Gwech, Ibejaik, thank you for coming. Kintam Jeff, thank you. Good morning, my name is Jeff Schiffer. I'm the Executive Director at Native Child and Family Services of Toronto. I just want to thank Vivian Roy for starting us in a good way. Uh, this morning, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the territory. I just want to acknowledge that we are gathered here in the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat Confederacy. I want to acknowledge the historical connections that the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Mississauga, the credit, our current treaty holders have to this territory. And also just acknowledge and recognize that Toronto today is home to tens of thousands of, of diverse Indigenous community members that call this city home. Land acknowledgements for me are never simply about acknowledging the historical connections of an Indigenous community to a particular place, but they're about talking about what we're doing in the present uh, to support those people in the now. And that's what this morning is about, uh, a concerted effort by the City of Toronto in partnership with a long-standing community partner to enhance the work we do to support Indigenous youth in the City of Toronto. Uh, with that, I would just like to uh, um, say that I'm very honoured to be able to welcome uh, Mayor John Tory um, to, to the podium. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Miigwech. Well, good morning, and Jeff, thank you. Um, you know, this is the second time in a month that I've been privileged to be at an announcement with Jeff, and, and uh, he would say it's not with him, of course, but it's with Native Child and Family Services of Toronto. And I think uh, as a city, while we have much more to do in many respects, we can be proud uh, of the partnership we've established with Native and, Cham uh, and Family Child Services, and we can be particularly proud of the work they do, because uh, these kinds of centres, which serve not only Indigenous communities, but serve the in entirety of the people of Toronto, serve as a wonderful place where we can provide particular uh, culturally sensitive and appropriate uh, services and supports to uh, Indigenous young people and others. But also, what's great to me is that uh, in, in the course of, of having other young people come here, they can learn about things that, frankly, I never learned about when I was uh, a, a student, about our Indigenous communities and, and, and some of their history and traditions, and frankly, some of the parts of our history that are shameful and that we need to learn more about and, and, and know more about. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here with somebody equally committed uh, to, uh, to this area of service and support that the city can provide, uh, namely Deputy Mayor Michael Thompson, who is not just a Scarborough councillor, which he is, but also as Deputy Mayor and Chair of Economic Development has been a leader in making sure that we brought about a dramatic expansion of our youth spaces and youth hubs across the city because we understand that this is a place where we can provide uh, excellence uh, in support uh, for uh, young people and their development. Um, you know, if you just look at some of the things, and it may not seem like much to go through the the small kind of uh, cooking thing, but that had a lot of meaning to it, not only just in terms of developing some basic skills, but also there was a, a meaning behind that tradition of, of cutting up the strawberries and making the strawberry water. And that's important for those young people to learn about, but also for people like me and other people of my uh, age. Uh, all of these uh, centers and these hubs provide people with new learning opportunities, with the new chance to develop uh, skills, but almost just as important as all of that put together is the opportunity to socialize with others, others from their own communities, but also others uh, from uh, the broader city of Toronto. And we know as a city government, we need to invest in these kinds of supports and resources. We need to have uh, more of these uh, places for young people uh, to access. 
And so I'm excited to announce that we now are in a position where all 20 uh, enhanced youth spaces and youth hubs are complete and are all opening today. And of course, they've been, they're not all opening today because we're having a grand opening. They're opening because they can. Uh, this has been delayed uh, considerably, of course, by the pandemic. And it is just something that uh, is a very proud and very happy day because I think it's going to be the beginning of something very special for all of these spaces to be open and to be available to these young people. And I, I say to people out there, you know, that are, are the hardworking uh, taxpayers, this is an investment of your money, but I think it's it's among the best investments that we make on your behalf because it's an investment in young people and in families, um, and it is something that is going to pay huge dividends in many different respects uh, going forward. These are built on three uh, pillars, really. First is a dedicated space for young people. So while large parts of this building are used by young people and for young people, there is some space now that we just saw today that is enhanced and provides activities very focused on uh, people of a certain age. Uh, the dedicated staff, of course, uh, that uh, we put together with people like uh, Jeff's organization, but also the City of Toronto itself. Uh, and then finally, uh, locally responsive programming that are the programs are actually co-designed with the young people so that we don't just kind of think as often older people do, well, we know what's best for them. Uh, we actually talk to them about what would be helpful and, and attractive to them because we want young people to come uh, to these places. These are supervised spaces that are open to young people uh, five to six days a week. They're located throughout the city. Uh, they include things like Wi-Fi, TV, uh, gaming consoles, foosball tables, pool tables, computers. Upstairs, we saw a recording, a, a small recording studio and some musical equipment, some equipment there where people could learn to be a DJ, which is again not just fun to do but it, and, and not just a, a positive um, activity but it's also something that could lead uh, to um, uh, you know employment activities and being able to earn an income i met somebody at one of our vaccine clinics in the last few days who has made a business out of uh, the a djing skill they acquired at one of these kinds of community facilities and that's just proof positive of how these things can be helpful they also have uh, photography barbering hairstyling yoga nail art uh, and, and so the list of activities is broad, but again, it is focused on things we've been told that the young people would like to have made available to them. Uh, the, uh, the hours at the enhanced youth spaces run from 12 to 5 during the summer, and then when school begins in September, the hours will extend into the evening. And I'm told that between all the different things that go on in a building like this, which is one of many across the city, that there's a lot of young people and other people from the community that end up here. Uh, this becomes a centre, uh, as we want it to be a focal point of activity. The ones that are in the public libraries, and we have a great partnership between the city, uh, public library, and people like uh, Native and Child Family Services, uh, we do these things together, which is the way I think you would want it. Uh, the um, the ones in the library, as you'd expect, are a bit more towards the, I'll call, I don't want to call it academic, that might scare people away, but uh, using a laptop, getting comfortable with technology, homework help, which is available here too. There's a nice table upstairs, so if somebody wants some help with their homework, and that is so important to people who might just need that little bit of extra confidence, that little bit of extra support in getting their homework done, because we know, I know from having listened over and over again, it just takes people falling behind a little bit in school because they're a little bit lacking in self-confidence about their work or they maybe aren't able to get the same kind of support at home because maybe a language barrier or something like that and that can lead on the pathway to dropping out of school and that of course for any young person no matter who they are um, is a very uh, uh, a very uh, bad development the youth hubs are open monday to friday from 3 30 to 7 and they're located uh, within library branches of course and some of them have capacity limits at the moment for health reasons but those will uh, change over time if you want to get more information on those ones that are in the library you can find that tpl.ca slash teens and similarly you can find uh, information about ours at toronto.ca. Uh, the expansion brings the city uh, of Toronto and Toronto Public Library's youth spaces to a total of 43 spaces and hubs with 66 full-time staff across the city. This is a significant initiative, a significant investment and a great job done by our city staff, by the library staff and our partner organizations in getting these up and running and of course keeping them running. It's one thing to get the room all outfitted uh, but it's another thing then to offer the programming day by day by day and do it in a way that keeps the confidence and support of the young people. This was first included in the
the 2020 budget. And you may say, well, why is it taking you so long? It's pandemic related. I mean, we, we, we set the money aside in the 2020 budget, but uh, it was, and that was to create 10 enhanced youth spaces. And for the youth hub, same thing. There was money set aside in the 2020 budget to enhance the number of those. And so your tax dollars went to providing for these places to be substantially enhanced, both in number and in the, um, types of, uh, of equipment and facilities and staff that are available. And they were um, selected to ensure that we address service gaps for young people and enhancing opportunities for those who might come from places and neighborhoods and backgrounds where they were experiencing higher levels of uh, potentially of violence, uh, certainly of, of marginalization and of poverty. And it has been a, a collaborative process to select the locations, working with stakeholders in the community, as well as with the city staff and with uh, different organizations that have um, then uh, created these partnerships to actually run the places beyond just selecting the locations. So we have partnerships with the Boys and Girls uh, Club of East Scarborough, with Native Child and Family Services of Toronto, as well as, for example, a collaboration with the 519 uh, down on Church Street uh, to ensure Indigenous youth and 2SLGBTQ plus uh, young people have, again, um, their own supports and engagement and outreach available to them so that we can make sure that they're included uh, in these programs. And they, the partnerships ensure that we're providing safe spaces, that we're providing programming that is sensitive and, and appropriate to the communities we're trying to serve and training opportunities for all. So um, I will just say that um, this place here where we are uh, reflects the good work done by Jeff and his organization right across the city. Um, I'm, I'm proud that we are doing that, that we started doing it some time ago, but it's really them uh, that are doing it. And this is just one of the excellent partners that we as a city, we couldn't do these things without partners. I mean, the city government knows how to do certain things very well, and we can get these things established and do some of the work of organizing how the places are selected and how they're programmed, but we rely on great partners. And, and it's better for us if we can find a location where there's an organization like this that's already kind of in business if I can call it that, because it just enhances uh, both uh, both sides of this. And, you know, a bit of encouragement, a bit of support um, is just going to make a world of difference to a lot of these young people and keep them on a positive track to being all they can be. That is why we're doing this. We are doing this because there are many young people out there, and they're, they're people who come from the widest possible variety of backgrounds, and sometimes because of their own personal circumstances, just their own personality, they need that little bit of support, that little bit of self-confidence, that little bit of skills and confidence building that is going to help them to be all they can be. Because we know, I know, Deputy Mayor Thompson knows, when we go to the neighborhoods across the city, all the kids, no matter which neighborhood you're talking about, they have the same ambitions. They start off with the same ambitions. But sometimes there are some things in their own lives that are lacking that we have to help just fill in to provide a little bit of that support so that they can be everything they want to be. And they want to be all the same things that all the other kids uh, in the city want to be. And we want to make sure that they have that opportunity, that this is not just the most diverse city in the world, but the most inclusive city in the world. And so I want to now introduce to say a few words uh, our Deputy Mayor, Michael Thompson. Um, he has been a leader uh, in making these places happen, a leader in making sure that we get this budget set aside, that we enhance uh, the number of these youth hubs and youth spaces and then make it happen. Because it's one thing to set aside the money in the budget, it's another thing to get yourself to here today when we can actually open all these places up and say that they're available for these young people to come and get all the dividends and advantages that they provide. So uh, thank you to Deputy Mayor Thompson, thank you to our city staff, uh, and thank you to uh, you, Jeff, and to our partners that make these things actually happen. Deputy Mayor, please. <laughs> it's Monday morning. We're doing the dance, Mayor and I. So, uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you uh, so much for being here. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, you know, the mayor, um, you know, thanked a lot of folks and so on, and, and myself, including. But, Mayor, I think it's really important for us to thank you. Um, your leadership, um, not only in government, but just general understanding with respect to community and the work that you've done over the years gives you a really good vantage point in which to view uh, the changes and the collaboration that we really need to bring forward in order to ensure that we get the best for our young people and we get the best coordination in order to make that happen. And then, of course, finally, that we put the resources that are needed in to make the investment. The investment is one thing, but it's also ensuring that the investment that we make is done in a way that provides a level of efficiency, 
coordination and collaboration. And as the mayor has just indicated with respect to Jeff and all the other organizations that we're working with and so on, it's absolutely fantastic. So without the leadership of the mayor, um, this wouldn't happen in the manner that uh, it is happening. And so we see obviously what the benefits are. We recognize what the opportunities are for our young people because um, a small investment in their future expands great opportunities for them but more importantly, for our society, for our city, certainly for our province and our, na our nation, and creating opportunities where these young people have developed skill set, leadership um, capabilities, and so on, to take on the challenges of the world, climate change, all the other things that we're facing, uh, issues relating to seniors, issues relating to pandemics and things like that. So these young people get to develop the skill set. And I remark by looking at the signage board here, it says, connect, create, learn, and inspire. And it talks about sports, arts, social uh, development, fashion, and leadership. And the mayor has given you a whole series of other things that uh, these young people are engaged in. So it's really important. So these, space, these spaces provide a safe place. It's a haven for, for young people to come in and to work with others and so on, and to really feel that they matter. It's extremely important, as well as to ensure their cultural sensitivity, that's really important as well. So this is a welcome place for young people in the city of Toronto. And, you know, more than that, though, um, as we talk a little bit about what these facilities um, provide, creativity, building confidence, helping these young people to understand that they have a place in our community, they have a place in our city, and it helps them as well connecting with respect to you know, old friends, new friends, as well as to work through any challenges that they may have, as well as the people who are working with them, may be able to identify some of the challenges that these young people are having. Uh, you know, you, you, you find yourself, uh, you, these young people have a receptive ear because they trust those people that are working with them. Those individuals are able then to offer them greater opportunities and access to things that are needed. And as the mayor has indicated, we are putting in the structure to actually help our young people. And a community that does not invest in their young people, fail them. And the mayor's leadership suggests that we will never fail our young people because they mean so much, not only to themselves, but to us and our future. And that's extremely important for us to be able to motivate, to inspire them. And I think that's extremely important for us in terms of recognition and i want to acknowledge uh, howie dayton who is here with us and the mayor's recognized how you know the team and so on because of this collaboration it is so important with respect to providing the support services that are available in these places and so on it, it it enriches them that's extremely important for us for our community you know we talk about scarborough we often recognize that this is such a great place um, not simply because of all the people that are here, but also the things that the people do and expand throughout the world, whether or not you're talking about the weekend and others who have achieved so much and so on in helping our community to grow. And so these young people will be proud, not only of our space, but of the place as well. So I'm really delighted that as the mayor has talked about the 20 uh, additional space that we have, uh, you know, uh, enhanced and, and expanded across the city. It's a important investment that these places, spaces that are now open to provide, again, the safe refuge for our young people and an opportunity for them to, to collaborate and so on. Because when we inspire them, they do great things. And I'll just take a moment, and an example. I often do this when I speak, because I look back at my own development. And I look back at the Friday nights that I would spend at Iondale Church on Ironview Road just across from the high school, the public school that I went to, which was Ironview Public School. We as young people didn't have a lot. And had we not had the church space myself, I could tell you that I probably would not be standing here with the mayor of Toronto, standing here and being introduced as deputy mayor, because I will tell you, I would have fallen through the cracks. Those cracks would have created for me, not a great future, but a future that you would not be proud of. And I hope that this story to tell you about me helps you to understand why we should and ensure that we make these investments in our young people 
with partnership with our different organizations and so on. So it's extremely important in terms of what we do and how we do it. And we must sustain this. So it is not just a one off or just for a period of time. It is forever because the opportunity and the needs for our young people will require that. And I know that the mayor's leadership and our commitment for council will ensure that we provide these um, opportunities and the investment for young people. So I'm very proud to stand here with you here today. And I'd now like to call back the amazing executive director, uh, Jeff Schiffer. Jeff, back to you. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. Um, I just wanted to close by making a few brief comments about uh, about the center here at Native Child and Family Services of Toronto. You know, with today's announcement in, in in Scarborough Child and Family Life Center, we welcome a new enhanced youth space that is designed to give youth the opportunity to, as the sign says, you know, connect, create, learn, and inspire. But we know today, uh, on the heels of you know Indigenous Peoples Month. Um, many of the struggles that are experienced by Indigenous youth and, and community, right? And we know that not only for Indigenous people, but as has been said by the Mayor and Deputy Mayor, our most sacred resource is our children. The most important investment a, a city or a community or a nation can make is in their children. And, and that's what is happening here today. Um, not only connecting youth to new opportunities, but connecting them to their culture. And there's a particular significance for that for Indigenous people. Um, this space is grounded in um, integrated uh, cultural service that we know will help to narrow those gaps and to support our youth as they move forward. And I just want to say that we have an existing space like this at our Native Youth Resource Centre on uh, at 655 Bloor and Christie's Pits. Um, it's often nice to talk about what we think these places may become. Um, we have the evidence, not only at Native Child, but through many other organizations, to show in a very evidence-based way the way that organizations and um, programs like this change lives, right? Um, whether it's the recent uh, Seventh Fire podcast that was just launched by our youth at, at, the, at the Bloor Center, or our Tribal Lands uh, streetwear clothing line that the youth were uh, have recently just launched, these concrete opportunities not only inspire youth, uh, um, support them in their education, uh, but create concrete pathways for, for wellness and prosperity as they move forward in their life. So I just would like to say on behalf of Native Child, um, and on behalf of the Scarborough community, who we are um, so privileged to serve, um, we're, we're so grateful uh, for the city and the mayor uh, for continuing to provide the support for the community out here in Scarborough. With that, I'd just like to say Chimi Gwich. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers. We will now begin a uh, media Q&A. As a reminder, it's one question, one follow-up, and I think we can unmute you, so don't worry about that. So first up, we have Brian Lilly from the Toronto Sun. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, Mayor Tory, it sounds like uh, you have uh, just described everyone's dream rec room in these centers, so they yeah. do sound very good. That's right. Uh, I, I want to ask you about a, a somewhat related question, though, and perhaps hear from both you and Deputy Mayor Thompson, um, based on some of what he just said. You're talking about youth centers uh, for to help people move ahead in life in the right direction. We've got part of our population that still isn't. Uh, in the last week, we've had 20 shootings, including one uh, on Friday at a, outside a school and daycare where a home was hit by two bullets. Uh, I know that you uh, support a full range of, of measures from handgun bans to other issues, but from the federal government, we're only hearing about the bans and the buybacks. Have you had discussions with the prime minister or given that looks like we're headed to an election, the opposition leaders about other issues that you've advocated for from bail reform to diversion programs to everything else that needs to be done in order to get a handle on what's an ongoing issue in toronto yes i've had those discussions uh, i should say that while i'm not minimizing the toll that continues to be taken by shootings and and uh, by by gun violence and other kinds of violence in our communities uh, some of the levels of that uh, gun violence are down this year and i think it's as a result of some of the efforts that we've been making in particular at the city uh, level with respect to putting people around tables in neighborhood after neighborhood on a very targeted basis to um to discuss ways in which we can prevent crime and i think that we have had some success with that and that's been uh, very much engaged in by the police as well. But on other fronts, uh, progress is slower to come, to be honest. 
uh, the bail reform thing, uh, everybody talks a good game, uh, but uh, the people who are in a position to do something about it um, have not moved as quickly as I think they should, because I think it is widely uh, a shared view among the public and the police and others, perhaps not the judiciary to the same extent, I say respectfully, that it is just not acceptable to have people that are out, and we have examples, examples, one after another, of people who are out over and over and over again on bail while the same gun charges they faced the first time are not even dealt with. And it's so discouraging for everybody, starting with the community, of course, but also the police, to be doing the work to actually apprehend these people, seize their guns, and then find that they're just back at it moments later, almost thumbing their nose at the system. And so I think there's work to be done on that. Uh, I think there is, I'm, I'm led to believe that consistent with some of the discussions I've had with the Prime Minister and Minister Blair, that there's some crime prevention funding coming shortly, which will um, help us uh, with uh, some of these activities that work on a collaborative basis so that we don't have to rely on a reactive approach, you know, where all you're relying on is for the police to show up after something has happened but rather we can work through spaces like this. And this is not about crime prevention, but it all helps. You know, if you include people, as Deputy Mayor Thompson said, if you have them feel supported, uh, they can build up their self-confidence. They stay in school. These are all part of the formula for making sure that they're on the good path, as opposed to even being tempted for a moment to be on the bad path. So we have a lot of work to do. And, um, you know, the priority that's been attached to this has been not non-existent, but I think we need to pick up the pace of our progress. And it really is all three governments working together with community organizations and with the police and everybody else to perhaps shift this approach from the reactive approach, which we relied on for so long, for so many years, to a proactive approach that says you take steps to prevent. But you've got to have the legal supports in place on things like bail reform to allow that to happen. Sure. Ryan, I just wanted to take a moment just to add, uh, you know, as, as Amir talked a little bit about um, sort of um, what I think is, um, is is a very difficult situation. It's it's about the sort of standard and or people just thumbing their nose at the system. Regrettably, that's happening way too often and way too much. Um, there's a real need for us to have a standard with respect to acceptance in our society. We either have the view that the challenge and the problems of the shooting is problematic and and it is and at the same time we have another view which is well those people who are doing this well you know we just can't really deal with them harshly and or we're just being too 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 difficult with them i, I don't think that that squares itself i mean i think we have to as the mayor has pointed out we have to do a lot of work and of course working with the other levels of government one of the things i've done in my own office personally um, one of my staff members, and, and she's here with us uh, today, uh, Ms. Keisha Francis, she is uh, responsible for community development. And one of the things that we've been working with her and her leadership is working to create jobs. So we are working with a number of organizations as part of the, what the mayor is trying to ensure that we do, that we collaborate and we actually use our resources because we can have greater impact in terms of our opportunities. So we're working with an organization now funded by Skills Development Ontario, to be able to create 400 opportunities for young people. Trade opportunity, training, paying their, uh, you know, their, their, their travel fare, paying for equipment, training, and so on. So it's, it's, it's one thing when we look at the, the sort of criminal activity and the use of guns and weapons and so on in our society. And that's a very bad thing because it, it, it does a lot of negative things for our community in general. It affects tourism, it affects business, it affects reputation and so on. So we are not only looking at the rules in terms of the criminal justice system, but we're also focusing on opportunities. We talk about what we're doing here today. Jobs are an important part of the equation in order to resolve some of these issues. And we are taking steps to do that. We also have social development and finance. We have tests. We have a lot of different uh, initiatives in the city that is attempting to address the issues with respect to young people. And the final thing I want to say, I think we also have to remember that we also have to support those families as well. Those moms and dads and so on need our support in order to ensure that they can support their own families. So that's part of where the disconnect occurs. And we're actually doing more to address those things. So again, part of the mayor's leadership is to ensure that we go through these processes in order to identify the needs and then to respond by putting solutions in place. Those are the things I just wanted to add to that, um, Jeff. Thank you. Well, Follow up, Brian? 
Uh, yeah, uh, regarding the uh, the clearance of uh, homeless camps uh, last week and in, in, in previous days, you've been criticized for letting them be there too long. You've been criticized for removing people. This is not a problem that's going to weigh. What would you say that over the last uh, week or so of, of dealing with this issue that uh, you and city leadership have learned and would do differently next time? Well, every time that you have one of these kinds of, uh, of, of uh, I'll call it an incident or a, a development in the a process of trying to house the homeless, that's what we're really trying to do at, at the core is to make sure people who are experiencing homelessness are given proper, safe, healthy indoor housing. Uh, but there are certain groups of people that it's more difficult to achieve that with than others. And every time we go to uh, having to actually clear an encampment, which is something that I think is the right thing to do in the context of safety uh, and health and and legality uh, and the principle that uh, public parks are for everybody, um, there's things you can learn uh, from that. I guess I, I, you know, there were learning experiences on both sides last week. There was a one a learning, two learning experiences that said it is possible if you get everybody cooperating with you, including people who don't show up to deliberately disrupt uh, the rehousing of people to do it peacefully and sensitively and compassionately. And that's exactly what we did in two locations last week. It also shows you, though, when people are there to protest and it's their legal right to do so, uh, that that can complicate. Uh, these things and and end up necessitating the use of police resources and other things uh, which which massively complicate the task of doing what we're at the core trying to do and have been trying hard to do for months and months and months thousands of times which is rehouse people who are experiencing homelessness that have big issues in their lives and so I would just say that it's a constant learning experience. We're always looking for ways to try and do better, but I can't back away from what you pointed out is the very difficult balance that I have to try and achieve as the mayor that is responsible ultimately for both the um, uh, housing of people experiencing homelessness and their safety and well-being, but also uh, for the availability of our parks to everybody and to frankly stand up for people in some neighborhoods where people of very limited means, people who are themselves marginalized, were unable to use the one public resource they would use the most in the summer months, which is their public park nearby because they were occupied by an encampment, which was which is not healthy, it's not safe, and it's not legal, and 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 it also stop these people from using their very own park. And so it's just part of what you come to realize in this job that you have to try and achieve that very difficult balance and, and address an issue that is incredibly complex because of the complexity of the problems that people experiencing homelessness face. And I'm not lacking one iota, notwithstanding all of the, what these people say to convenience themselves when they write letters and spout off, I'm not lacking in an ounce of compassion about this, but I have a broad set of, of responsibilities that I have to um, I have to attend to with the city staff and everybody else involved. I don't direct everything they do, but I have to um, address myself to the concerns of all the people who live in the city of Toronto, not just any particular small group. Thank you, Brian. Next up, we have Jennifer Pagliaro. Go ahead. Morning, Mayor. I wanted to ask in conjunction with the safety plan that council approved, whether the public can expect more spaces like this to open. Obviously, we know that there's a, a record of these spaces being incredibly useful. And obviously, the delay was pandemic related. Um, otherwise, they would have been open sooner and, and maybe staff considering a further location. So just wondering if that's your hope that money would be put towards a practical use like the space you're in. Well, obviously, when the safety O program came forward, um, and it represented a, a huge transformation from a, an approach that was over time, much more based on reaction, you showed up, the police showed up, other people showed up when something undesirable happened, whether it was over the long term or the very short term, to now an approach that talks about how you can build and prevent and support um, so as to stop any of that kind of bad activity from happening to begin with. And the underpinning of the report Report was uh, that it required you to to invest and to make sure that you had these different kinds of supports, such as the one we're standing in today, available to young people and people of other ages, uh, so that um, they would have a positive path to pursue. So they would have supports that would um, stop them from, as Deputy Mayor Thompson said, falling between the cracks. And so the answer is undoubtedly has to be yes. That there's going to have to be some investment. The question becomes. Is it brand new investment or can we find ways to shift uh, from other, other areas that are not as effective or useful in this day and age to areas that are going to be more useful in, in, in paying bigger dividends for families and kids and other people? And that's what the budget process will do for 2022 and to make sure and the implementation plan that's going to come forward for safety, which comes, I think, later uh, this year. 
follow up? And Mayor, just on a different topic, I wanted to ask you about the uh, what I expect to be an upcoming clearing of Moss Park. We obviously know that uh, those uh, uh, folks have been issued trespass notices along with uh, the earlier uh, encampments. And just wondering, you know, what your expectation is for uh, that eventual uh, interaction. Obviously, you've been heavily criticized uh, for the city's uh, clearing of of Alex Park and and Lamport and earlier Trinity and I just wanted to know uh, uh, understanding that uh, as you say you don't direct operations but uh, as mayor of this city what you expect to happen. Well, my fondest wish and the objective of every ounce of the effort being made by the city administration, uh, the city staff, the very capable and compassionate city staff is that we achieve uh, what we achieved, I think, largely in, say, Alexander Park, where uh, an encampment clearing there and the rehousing of people experiencing homelessness took place relatively without incident. And I would hope in Moss Park and other places across the city, that is indeed what we could achieve. People are not aware of the fact that place after place after place, whether it be an encampment of two tents or six tents or 12 tents, um, we are actually rehousing and offering safe, healthy uh, indoor housing to people, uh, you know, on a daily basis. And we will continue with those efforts. And that's what we will continue to do in Moss Park as elsewhere. Um, and uh, the trespass notices are served because it is uh, a fact that um, the presence of those encampments in public parks on a continued basis is not consistent with, with what the law provides or with the equitable sharing and use of those parks by all people, including some people in some of those neighborhoods who themselves are very marginalized and very limited uh, in their access to recreational other facilities for themselves and for their children. And so we will continue with our efforts to have people safely rehoused as a result of the great efforts of our street outreach workers. And when you say that I've been uh, broadly criticized, uh, I would just say to you, yes, there's been criticism come from a certain quarter, uh, but I think a lot of people understand, first of all, the incredible effort that we've made as a city, uh, including under my leadership uh, and the leadership of the council uh, in allocating hundreds of millions of dollars to care for the homeless, to provide them with options, uh, to uh, make efforts as we've done with 1,700 plus people to safely rehouse them. I think people are appreciative and understanding of those efforts and also understanding of the fact that there does come a time especially when you have people that are consciously and deliberately preventing us from effectively carrying out that work of, of, of voluntarily and, and, and collaboratively rehousing those people, that there is a time uh, that you have to say that we have to do something different. And, and I hope that that time doesn't come with any future uh, places, but because uh, we're going to continue with the work uh, on a collaborative basis with the people experiencing homelessness and our and agencies and city staff. But um, you know, we will do what we have to do to first and foremost uh, rehouse the homeless in a better uh, setting, and secondly, to make sure that um, that our public parks are uh, available to everybody, uh, and that is a very important a part of the job that we all have to do. Thank you, Jennifer. And last up, we have Linda Ward from CBC. Go ahead, Linda. Hey, good morning, Mayor. Just following up on the encampment uh, issue. Today, some encampment residents and supporters are going to be holding a rally outside of City Hall calling for an end to the type of evictions that we've seen in places like Lamport Stadium and other encampments. What's your response to them? My response is that the city has and will continue to make every effort over extended periods of time involving thousands of visits and many, many city staff people and help with other agencies to safely uh, rehouse people who are living in these encampments because these encampments are not a proper, safe, or healthy form of housing and they're not legal. And that we've established that principle over and over again. I think most people in the city of Toronto actually agree with that. And so I would like to hope that we could work with these people, uh, the very same people that are going to protest, and I welcome their uh, their right to protest and the fact they choose to do so. But I would hope we could work with them. It's interesting that when I've been out beating the drum across the city, as I've been all summer and all spring for supportive housing, which is the very kind of housing that is needed by people who are in encampments and have issues in their lives, I've seen, I don't think any of these people have been there to help me with that uh, when it faces some pushback from some of the neighbours and some of the people who have a lot of questions. And so I would hope we could work together uh, on that um, and that we will continue with our efforts to safely and, and uh, uh, collaboratively rehouse uh, the people who are in need of help and um, we'll do our best uh, and, and try to do it in a way that is peaceful and collaborative and effective and we've done it thousands of times so far and we'll continue to do it hundreds of times more um, and hopefully it can apply to every single person who's experiencing homelessness follow up what happened uh, last week at lamport was not uh i would say 
from anybody's perspective, ideal. Uh, and in speaking with city spokespeople, uh, they said usually after these kinds of operations are carried out, there is an examination that is done uh, to look at, you know, is there anything that needs to be changed uh, in terms of the method or the approach? Would you commit to pausing future clearing until that examination can be done? And if possible, sitting down with some of the uh, people who oppose the methods that you have uh, been carried using uh, to clear these uh, encampments? Well, to be clear, the present program that is in place is one that will continue as it did every single day without exception to uh, collaboratively and voluntarily rehouse people who are in encampments. And that is the program. There's no set schedule to do anything else. And we have been successful day after day after day. It gets very little attention at clearing encampments in a collaborative manner and helping the people who are experiencing homelessness. And so I would say that when it comes to any operation that our city staff are involved in, any operation that the police are involved in, I know that from my own service on the police board, they debrief and they look at things. That they're, everybody, every organization in the city is always trying to do things better than the day before. That's what we're, we come to work to try and do better today than we did yesterday. And so I'm sure those discussions are ongoing. Uh, but I will just say that, um, you know, we have to continue with our work and the principal core uh, task in front of us is to convince as many of these people as possible through voluntary and collaborative means to uh, re have themselves rehoused into uh, proper indoor housing that is safe and healthy for them and legal. Uh, and to make sure that our parks are available to all people in the city of Toronto who uh, need and want uh, to use them. And so we'll continue with that approach and you learn every day. But every like one thing I, even at my age and stage in my career, I'm learning every day. Uh, I'm learning when I'm here. I'm learning about how we can deal better with uh, people experiencing homelessness. I will admit I've learned a couple of things and we're working hard right now. The city staff are working hard on a number of elements of the letter that has been uh, so much uh, paid attention to. I don't mean the letter that was um, you know, came from the city councillors who love writing letters. The letter that came from all the activists in the community. We've got a number of those uh, of those ideas under you know active uh, consideration because they could allow us to uh, improve how we um, convince people collaboratively to come in uh, to indoor housing. But uh, we'll we'll keep at that, and it's a very very difficult issue. And anybody who thinks there's an easy answer to it or pretends there is is uh, trying to fool people. And I would just say as well that the one thing that we have learned for sure, I know this for sure, and people don't like it when I say it, but I'm just being straightforward about it. Where we have the opportunities to go and clear encampments and hundreds of protesters don't show up and don't say when they come to the city staff that they're seeking a conference with the police and don't try to resist the efforts of hardworking, compassionate city staff to voluntarily rehouse people, then we have a lot higher success rate with people actually getting rehoused, which is the real objective than we do when they do show up and decide to cause a ruckus. So that's all I know. That's just a fact. Thank okay. you. Okay. That's it for today, everybody. Thank you and have a great Monday.